Okay. So good morning, everyone. Really appreciate you uh, joining. Uh, my name is Sean Burns. I'm with 3CREN, Tri-County Regional Energy Network. I'm really pleased to uh, help present Understanding Calgary for residential and non-residential projects today uh, with Lauren Hotel, Franklin Energy, and Andy Pease uh, with InBalance Green Consulting. Um, Perfect. I'll just run through a quick overview of 3C Runs programs and some upcoming offerings, and then we'll jump right into the content. Um, so I'm sure we're all familiar with Zoom at this point, but just as a quick refresher, um, this is a Zoom meeting, so we do ask that you please keep yourself muted. Uh, but there will be time for questions today, uh, so you can use the raise hand function if you'd like to share a comment verbally. Um, and as always, we encourage questions, comments, uh, resource sharing in the chat. Um, so really uh, appreciate that dialogue. Um, and if you see anyone else or my background with the, the 3C Ren logo on it, please feel free to directly message us um, in the chat box for any other questions you have about our programs or offerings. Um, we'll be happy to answer. And for anyone new to our trainings, maybe asking yourself who is 3C Ren, what is 3C Ren? Uh, well, like I mentioned, the Tri-County Regional Energy Network is a collaborative partnership between three counties on the Central Coast, that's San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, and Ventura. Uh, and our goal is to improve energy efficiency programs on the Central Coast uh, through programs that are, are customized for the Central Coast and our professionals. Uh, so we offer free services for, for both professionals and households, uh, like industry training events, technical and soft skills trainings. Um, and then for households, we offer also offer our discounted kind of home upgrades um, to reduce energy use at home. Um, and so 3C Ren is funded by ratepayer dollars. Uh, so we get to, uh, everyone is charged a, a fee on their utility bills um, that goes to the state and we get to return some of that funding back to our central coast uh, to invest in our community, uh, invest in our workers and, and strengthen our local economy. Um, perfect. And this is just a nice illustration. Uh, we really want to take a holistic approach to energy uh, in our region. And you know, buildings and energy cover so much um, that we want to include both the professionals, our workforce, uh, and those who use energy, all of us, um, in our own lives too. So we're trying to touch all the points across Central Coast. Um, and with that, I think we'll go Oops, ahead. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I'll go uh, ahead and hand it over to again. our code experts. Um, again, that's Lauren Hotel, with Franklin Energy, and Andy Pease with In Balance Green Consulting. So Lauren and Andy. The sorry. <laughs> Uh, Sean, I realized that I, I, I had scooched that slide around. Do you still want to do this introduction, though, of the specifics of these three programs? Um, you know, you... sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so backing up. <laughs> sorry, you guys sorry, were done. my bad. <laughs> um, so I'll just run through our, our three programs a little more uh, in depth here. Uh, so Energy Code Connect is kind of the program hosting this training, uh, really focused on the energy code, offers training and, and support, direct support through our energy code coach. So you can ask a question and receive a, an answer within 24 hours. Um, and we also offer our regional forum that just happened this earlier this week too. And you can check out our website to view that recording. Um, but simply put, we wanna make the energy code a little bit easier to comply with, uh, understand and, and follow. Um, our other training program, Building Performance Training, uh, serves both current and existing and, and prospective building professionals um, on both technical skills and soft skills. Um, you know, how do you market energy efficiency and the skills you learn? Um, and we really want to help our workers thrive in an industry that's evolving and, and always moving. Um, perfect. And then to get involved, I would recommend visiting our website um, to learn more about the energy code, um, our other trainings and events. Um, and you can also call our energy code coach and Lauren can tell you all about that. I know she is one of our energy code coaches. Um, perfect. Now I will <laughs> hand it over to, to Lauren and Andy. Uh, thank you so much for being with us today. Yeah, thank you. So I, I think maybe Andy and I can introduce ourselves real fast. Um, as Sean said, 
uh, we are both co-coaches under the Energy Code Connect program. Uh, we monitor the questions that come in. Please feel free to send in any energy or green building code question that you could possibly have. Um, just a background on me. My name is Lauren Hotel. I work with Franklin Energy. Um, and I've been working in this space for about six years, uh, mostly educating building departments and contractors and the like um, on code compliance and trying to learn how we can make the process easier for you all. Um, so Andy, I don't know if you want to say a quick word. Sure. I'm Andy Pease. I'm an architect and uh, principal at Inbalance Green Consulting. And we're uh, pleased to be able to partner with uh, Franklin Energy and 3C Ren to uh, provide a whole uh, series of offerings for um, uh, energy code, energy performance, uh, and in this case, Cal Green. Yeah. So why are we here today? We're here to learn about Cal Green. Uh, the training today, we hope that you come away with this. Uh, with an understanding of what Cal Green is, what the compliance process is, both for res and non-res. Um, we're going to go through some tier one and tier two options at the end, and we hope that you're able to, to come away with this with a familiarity of, of Cal Green, what's mandatory, the green building benefits of all of them, and then also hopefully some tools and best practices for working with it. So we'll go ahead. We have a quick poll for you all. Uh, it's just one question. We'd love to learn, you know, why why are you here today? So Sean, if you want to, perfect. So we'll take a maybe a few minute a minute or so to get everybody's answer. Uh, this just helps us get a better idea of why you wanted to come to the training today. <laughs> Looks like we. Uh set it up you can only pick your top ones <laughs> we don't want to know That's all a... the reasons just one of them <laughs> <laughs> all right a few more folks want to get their answers in and we'll uh, share the results in a moment here All right, I think that's most folks, so I'll end the poll now. Awesome. So it looks like most of you are here to increase your general code knowledge and want to hear a little bit more about green building. You're in the right place. Uh, so we'll go ahead and jump in. Uh, the purpose of Cal Green, why, why is it a, a code that we have to follow? Um, in general, it's it's there to help make better buildings. Um, Cal Green is going to help you meet code, but it's also build helping you build your building that's healthier for the occupants. It saves some energy typically, and it'll help you have fewer callbacks. So, essentially, the the purpose of of Cal Green is to provide a baseline green building code, but uh, it still raises the bar for the state. Um, but it's still feasible for builders to to achieve. Um, there are two um, voluntary tiers that are a little bit higher than the baseline Cal Green. So today we're going to mostly focus on mandatory. We will talk about uh, tier one and tier two, the voluntary slash, you know, reach code options uh, towards the end. Uh, in terms of uh, the where Cal Green came from, you know, it was back in the 70s that uh, the state of California adopted the California Energy Code and title, you know, fictionally known as Title 24. Uh, then in the late 90s, early 2000, uh, LEED certification came around. There was a lot of confusion about what makes something green. Is it just having solar panels or non-toxic materials or uh, sustainably forested wood, et cetera? And so LEED ended up kind of creating this framework. And then just, um, you know, 2009, uh, Cal Green came on the scene, and thankfully for all of us that had been in the lead world for a long time, uh, Cal Green really follows uh, that same structure in terms of uh, priorities and organizations. So the overall idea is as we go through the code that we're making better buildings, meeting code, and using Cal Green as a tool to be able to make sure that we're covering what, um, what the state has, uh, I think, generally appropriately determined as the highest priority. 
Uh, so as a reminder, Title 24, as the uh, building officials always like to remind us, is the whole building code. Uh, and so we're focusing today on part 11, the California Green Building Standards Code, not to be confused with title uh, with part six, which is the energy code. Um, so all, all important, all good building codes, and we're focusing on 11 today. And just uh, some more quick reference for you. There's um, an adoption matrix at the beginning of each chapter to show which, uh, which sections are applicable to which buildings and which state agency uh, has the authority over each of those. And again, that's just for, for reference. Um, this is another reference slide for you all. It's just an overview of the chapters within CalGreen. Today, we're going to focus on chapters four and five, uh, the residential and non-residential mandatory measures. And then we'll touch on the uh, voluntary measures at the end. So in terms of the, uh, the scope itself, there's uh, chapter four is residential, chapter five is non-residential. Chapter three tells you the scope between the two and what, what triggers uh, Cal Green in the first place. So in residential, basically anything new, or if you have an alteration or addition that adds area or volume. But if you do that addition, it doesn't trigger you to have to go back and retrofit other uh, uh, priorly, prior permitted work. So for non-res, there's actually a, a little exemption for tiny, for very small projects under a thousand square feet or an alteration with a permit valuation under 200,000 square feet. Uh, the exception though is that old plumbing fixtures just by kind of separate state law are required to um, uh, have an upgrade if you have the old 1.6 or higher, those do need to be upgraded. Uh, the, there's a couple little things to look out for. If you have a mixed occupancy, like if you have um, that uh, uh, residential above, but commercial below, you actually end up needing to do two Cal Green checklists. And, um, and if you're phasing in a building, the shell will need to be Cal Green for what's applicable to that. And then the tenant improvement after that. Um, interestingly, only the uh, initial uh, uh, tenant improvement um, is going to need the, like the commissioning and those types of uh, bigger building issues. Otherwise, a TI will still need to uh, trigger Cal Green. Uh, it's free online. Yay! So you can always go and uh, find these uh, codes, check them out. They're pretty user friendly. Uh, we will be distributing the a PDF of these slides after the presentation so you don't have to take too many notes and you'll have all of this available to you. We'll also, as we're going through, we'll try to touch on what does compliance look like? A lot of folks are using um, these sheets that are provided by the AIA. These are okay, um, but, the more, but the important thing is, is that just because you put this sheet in your plan set does not demonstrate compliance. You actually have to implement it just like you can't put you know, a building code and say that it's done. You actually have to do it. So. In here in the small print is a, a yes or not applicable. And then you put the detail in the reference sheet. So you do need to um, fill this sheet out, not just have it in your plan set. So let's go ahead and jump in. Um, just a quick overview of the chapter division. So we'll be going uh, sort of chapter by chapter. Um, and then in the, the upper right-hand corner, there'll be a code reference. So if it starts with a four, it's for residential. If it starts with a five, it's for non-residential. And that's just for you to be able to reference at a later time if you are looking at these slides and want to look up the specific code language. Um, because there's a lot of overlap between res and non-res, we're going to cover them at the same time. So let's jump into planning and design. So the very first measure is stormwater drainage and retention during construction. This is for projects that are less than an acre or disturbing less than an acre. Um, the goal of it is really to prevent flooding and erosion um, and to keep the soil runoff uh, from on site. Um, so some ways that you can kind of go about that is like a burlap mat uh, or straw wattles at the border to keep um, perimeter soil within. Um, you can also use sandbags to help filter runoff and then, you know, something like a, a silt fence or straw mulch to prevent uh, soil from blowing off of the site. 
Um, again, this is really just for, for projects that disturb less than one acre of soil. And uh, within that uh, category also is the best management practices for stormwater, which has to do with the cleanliness of the site itself, that your equipment, you need to be careful of the fueling and, um, uh, uh, you know, you don't want oil dripping on the site that needs to be done off site and spill prevention and control, managing your washout areas. Um, and then if you're disturbing more than an acre, then you're going into a kind of the other standard world of the um, uh, national, let's see, the pollutant discharge. I'm not gonna, we have that uh, spelled out here, but NIPTES is it what we uh, call that. Um, it's the stormwater pollution prevention plan that uh, is pretty standard for the larger projects. So documentation, civil drawings, Erosion, sedimentation, dust control plans, et cetera. Uh, grading and paving. Um, so your plans need to show need to indicate how the project is going to keep water from entering the buildings, either through site grading or some type of drainage system. Uh, methods to move water away from the building can be a rain garden, some type of retention basin, a French drain, dry dry wells or cisterns, and there's a couple examples. Um, on the slide of, of those. And um, again, your documentation, you your site plan needs to show the required slope on the flat work uh, and as well as on the landscape plans. Um, and then I think we have a couple more examples. So we have a dry well um, to a cistern and then on the, the right, a rain garden or retention basin. Um, and then if I'll go to the next slide, here are some more examples. Um, so, uh, I know that this could be sort of a frustrating, you know, do I have to include this? Um, it really makes a difference to have these sort of really beautiful ways to incorporate drainage and these help reduce heat island effect. Um, it's a way to show off native and adaptive species. And it also, as we're in the midst of a, or entering into a massive drought, it also helps us uh, replenish our aquifers. Um, so this is a, a good reference slide. Great. Uh, so going on to bicycle parking, uh, it's important to uh, keep in mind that there's two types of bicycle parking in the Cal Green Code, the short term visitor parking. So if I'm going to I'm biking to a meeting, I want to have a, a bike rack right in front of the um, office store, whatever. And but it can just be a bike rack. And it's um, and then for long term parking, that's going to be if you're biking to work and you're leaving your nice bike, you wanna have it uh, protected in some way. So it either needs to have an interior room uh, or it needs to have a, um, an enclosed space. It could be the bike lockers or, and I'll show you a couple of examples. Um, in terms of how much, there's a little bit of flexibility because it's proportional to how much uh, vehicle parking you have. So if you have a hundred spaces, if 20 of them are for visitors and 80 of them for employees, those are the 20 and 80 are what you use to determine the, um, the 5% for the um, bike uh, parking for each kind. Uh, public schools, community colleges have slightly different requirements, which might make sense because you're gonna have um, uh, more likelihood of biking. And you do need to show the bike racks on the plans, the details, the specifications, and the calculations as well so that um, the plan checker can make sure that you're um, covering it correctly. So um, in terms of the bike parking itself, the, these two on the left, uh, the, the, this is a fine rack, but it's still in an exposed public garage in this case. And so that would not count as protected. The one on the bottom here is a movable rack. So it needs to be permanently secured. Uh, these are good. It's in you know, a cage that employee would have a key to or an outside locker. Um, these are, you know, there's, uh, you got to make sure that it's going to be um, easily, easily loaded. So this one could be fine if it's in a room um, or again in an enclosed space. So jumping into electric vehicle charging, uh, this is sort of more of a reference slide that applies to all projects. That's why there's no uh, code reference up at the upper right. Um, 
So essentially all projects need to have a raceway to the main panel. Uh, it needs to uh, have a dedicated 240 volt 40 amp circuit. Um, and it needs to be labeled as EV capable at the panel. So at the bottom of the screen, there's sort of a chart uh, of what does EV capable mean? What does EV ready mean? And what does EV installed mean? Um, we're only focusing, the code only calls out EV capable. So that's all we are gonna focus on. Uh, so single family or new single family, one and two single family dwellings, uh, townhouses with attached private garages need to have this. Um, the exception would be a new ADU or J ADU, junior ADU um, without Is additional there parking. Accessory dwelling units. Yes. For, I'm trying to remember to. <laughs> Thank you. Our, you yeah. Um, and the documentation that you need to show, you need to have the calcs on the, on the sheets. Um, you need to show locations on the site plans and make sure that it's, it's labeled correctly. Um, and you also need to make sure that you have the conduit and panel space on your electrical sheets. Um, multifamily. Uh, you need to have EV spaces that are 10% of total parking um, for future uh, electric vehicle charging equipment. Um, when the charters are installed, you need to make sure that the space is adjacent to an accessible space um, or an accessible route is what the code says. Um, again, documentation, you need to have um, uh, the demonstrate the ability for, or the capability and capacity for future EV charging. Um, again, the spaces don't, they don't need to be available until the EV charters are installed, but you do need to st still do the full conduit 240 volt 40 amp uh, service. Um, hotels and motels have their own table under residential. Um, it's actually the same table that's on the next slide, just in a different section. Um, uh, Non-residential is still just installation for future electric vehicle charging. It's based off of the number of parking spaces. Um, yeah, I think that's all I have to say on that. <laughs> and then as Lauren was starting to, um, to allude to is that there are accessibility requirements. This isn't in Calgary. This is in um, in the ADA and chapter uh, of the uh, California Building Code. Uh, so, uh, so if you actually do install chargers, just heads up, uh, at least one of them needs to be van accessible, and it kind of it goes from there, and um, uh, and that doesn't count as one of your accessible spaces in terms of the code itself. So, path of travel, et cetera, just more of a heads up. Uh, to be looking out for that. And then also be careful on the, um, the spaces themselves and how you label them. Um, they have very specific language. Don't do this one on the left and make up your own. It needs to just be clean air, van pool slash EV. And those are, this is for the preferred parking. Um, I think they're dropping this in the next code cycle. So uh, it's kind of been, I think it was a, a reasonable awareness thing in big parking lots, but it's kind of served its purpose and it's going to get phased out. Um, and then in terms of don't, if you only have infrastructure, don't label the space as electric vehicle. Um, so make sure you have the chargers installed before you label for electric vehicles. Uh, light pollution is in the non-residential section, and they're basically, if you, I mean, this is just kind of being considerate, right? Um, and the um, uh, lighting zones um, are, are labeled depending on how intensive the light is. Their lighting fixtures all have a label of backlight, uplight, and glare. And so depending on what lighting zone you're in, you need to make sure that you have the appropriate kind of um, cutoff there. Uh, thankfully, the, this Cal Green cycle, they've uh, aligned better with the energy code to have uh, exceptions for lights that are uh, very low wattage. And then just another one of those, keep an eye out for uh, DSA. If you're doing schools, the um, Division of State Architect has some uh, different uh, requirements in terms of shade trees. On to cool. Easy enough. So that the entire chapters 4.2 and 5.2 
basically says you must comply with 2019 Title 24 Part 6 uh, and any local reach code. So um, if we have anybody on the line from the city of San Luis Obispo or Ojai, you may have some different requirements that you'll have to follow. For everybody else, just got to follow the energy code. And that's it. Uh, okay, let's jump into water efficiency and conservation. So a lot of these um, in the next few slides are going to be a lot of uh, sort of limits that you have to hit. I'm not going to go through all of them. I know you can all read. You can look at the screen <laughs> and you will get a copy of this afterwards. So don't worry about trying to memorize all of this now. Um, so the, the one thing I do want to call out is um, metering faucets have been updated since the 2016 code cycle. Um, all non-compliant fixtures need to be replaced with water conserving fixtures. Um, there's, uh, you can look at the civil code um, for the definition and the buildings affected and the enactment dates if you wanna get a little bit more information. Um, the other thing I just wanna call out is residential bathroom faucets have both a minimum and a maximum flow. Um, that's really because in a residential bathroom, you're probably using the sink for, uh, shaving or you know whatever it is you need to fill the sink up a little bit uh you wouldn't be doing that in a public bathroom typically um so yeah feel free to reference this later uh continuing with uh plumbing fixtures and fittings um you need to make sure that the toilets and urinals are meeting the limits within uh the two res and non-res uh, sections right here um shower heads um we need to make sure that your shower heads are less than 1.8 gallons per minute um, flow. If you have multiple shower heads, so like the, the pictures on the screen, the, uh, specifically the one on the left, the total combined flow at any time still cannot be more than 1.8 gallons per minute per valve. So um, if you're in a dual uh, head shower, um, you cannot have 1.8 gallons per minute coming out of each shower head. Um, if you're lucky enough to have a fancy shower like that, it still has to be uh, probably split between the two. So it'd be 0.9 um, gallons per minute per, per shower head. Right, unless like the one on the right is clearly uh, two different people. Right. You know, if it's a shower for two people and shower heads are far enough apart, they can each meet the 1.8. But if one person can get under both shower heads, then that's when it needs to um, be split. Uh, in terms of meters, the in the non-residential, if you have a uh, multiple tenants in a space, um, in a you know the single shell, uh, ideally they're all uh, metered separately. But um, if you have, uh, it's required for spaces that each space uses over 100 gallons of uh, water a day. But if you think about like, okay, gallons per day, if you're in a, if it's a small retail or a small office that has a, a bathroom in the back that's just for the employees, that's probably using under 100 gallons per day and, and doesn't need its own uh, submeter. So it's really more of a focus on uh, restaurants or laundry, you know, types of facilities. Um, so those spaces all for sure need to have a, um, a, a their own submeter. Uh, there's a few uh, uh, items that came up in the code cycle in terms of restaurants. So food waste disposers uh, have their own um, limits as well as uh, pre-rinse valves. In uh, terms of Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah, so in terms of the, um, the irrigation, there's a um, model water efficiency landscape ordinance, um, WELO, and that has a calculation. You can do it online. This is one of those tricky ones because um, uh, sometimes uh, on a big commercial project, people are really, uh, you know, professional landscape architects always do these, um, these calculations. But in truth, uh, residential are some of the larger um, irrigation water users. And sometimes they'll say like, oh, we're not doing landscaping or we're doing that later. And then it kind of slips through. It used to just slip through the permit process, uh, but they really, uh, jurisdictions uh, appropriately have really um, uh, put the kibosh on that. And, and you, if you're doing um, over 500 square feet of landscape, uh, you really do need to, to do all your um, calculations for this. 
and then um, uh, there's some uh, special uses, so Muello in terms of the public schools and uh, health facilities must also comply. Uh, in terms of recycled water, the code is basically saying if you have recycled water available, you know, municipally supplied within 300 feet of your project site, um, for residential, you should require it, you should install it, but it, it, it's a little softer, but on non-res, you're required to install that uh, recycled water, uh, unless there's a particular exemption or you don't have any much landscaping at all. We're just flying through this. I hope everybody yeah, is. We I, are. I'm not seeing any questions in the chat, but uh, <laughs> feel free to stop us at any time. Um, so we'll jump into uh, material conservation and resource efficiency, uh, road improving. So the, under the CEC, the, the energy code says you need to air seal all penetrations. Under Cal Green, you need to rodent seal all penetrations. Uh, that could be anything from cement mortar or concrete um, or something similar like a metal. Um, why do we do this? Like, do, we don't want rodents climbing in through everything before everything's closed up. Um, we just need to make sure that you're, you're using something stronger than foam on the exterior. Um, yeah, because they chew, they chew through the foam, yeah. the, the critters. You don't want those things in your wall. Uh, and then uh, there's a few elements about uh, weather protection. There's a couple of these that kind of fit in the duh category, like, yeah, we're going to have, you know, a, a reasonable um, uh, weather resistant barrier at the foundation, at the envelope and, um, and that continuity. So you can't have any, you know, gap that um, uh, might be exposed to moisture or critters. And then in terms of uh, uh, moisture protection is, um, is that you can't have um, irrigation that sprays onto the building. Hasn't been as much of a problem because we are using so much more drip, but you can see the issue of if you have the spray head and then a bunch of water and, and you end up, they open up the walls years later and there's just you know intensive mold that's uh, uh, impacting the indoor air quality of the building. Also uh, newer that uh, not all folks are necessarily aware of, but in non-residential, you can't, uh, you have to have um, the doorway covered in some way. So you, first it has to have non-absorbent flooring. So you can't just have um, walk straight onto to carpet. You need to have um, either walk off mat or tile or something durable. And then you also have to either have a four foot deep um, overhang or a recess of four feet. So they just don't want the driving rain anytime a door opens that the, the water is getting into the building itself. Uh, construction waste reduction. So you need to recycle or salvage a minimum of 65% of construction waste. So this uh, hazardous waste, excavated soil and land clearing debris does not count. Um, those have to be diverted 100%. Uh, this measure does require a waste management plan. Um, and if you have a local ordinance that requires higher than 65%, you're required to meet that instead of uh, just general cow green. Uh, there is an optional pathway to prove reduced generation and the, the limits are on the screen there. Uh, the goal of this is really just to reduce the amount of waste that you're, you're producing. Um, and this is applicable to all non-res projects when a permit is pulled. Um, there are some, uh, as well as, as residential. Um, if you go to the next slide, there's some examples here. Um, so on the, on the left, we have source separation. So this is to, to help reuse or recycle the material. So you're separating it out so it can go to the correct place. Um, and then on the right, we have reduced volume. Um, that's part of the alternate pathway that you can participate in. It's, it's to just show that you have a reduced amount of waste, which is good for everybody. And then within the non-res world, if you're doing an addition or alteration uh, that you're required to um, uh, appropriately address the, uh, the, the universal waste, so that's um, uh, items that could be um, household hazardous waste, fluorescent lamps, anything that you know, contains mercury. Uh, and, and so you have to have a plan in place to address that. Uh, documentation, we usually just add that as a note to the plan set um, so that the contractor is aware of it. And as noted, 100% of uh, land clearing debris must be 
um, uh, used as uh, mulch or green waste. Uh, operation and maintenance manual. So this is required for both res and non-res. Um, there's 10 subjects that need to be included. This is anything from utility and water um, and waste recovery providers, public transportation. Um, there needs to be some education material on the positive impacts of keeping the interior relative humidity between 30 and 60%, uh, water conserving landscape design, gutters and downspout maintenance, incentive programs, et cetera. Um, it, the goal of it is really to uh, maintain the benefits of a green home and, and green building. Um, this is to help the, the new homeowners or new tenants just you know, have a better idea of what to do. Um, also for maintenance staff um, to help educate them as well. This documentation, uh, the, the requirements need to be in the notes on the plan set. Um, something that's really helpful is you could, you could provide a template to the builder um, that they can use for everything so they're not trying to dig something up every time. Um, for non-res projects, you can lean on the commissioning process to verify compliance with this, and Andy will touch on this um, in, a, in a few slides. Uh, recycling. Uh, so if you have more than five units, you have to have a recycling and compost or organic waste collection on site, um, or you need to meet whatever the local recycling ordinance is. Um, Non-residential additions that are adding more than 30% of floor area have to comply. Um, we threw the consideration for restaurant food waste on there as something to consider um, as, you know, food waste breaks down, it releases methane, um, which is something that the state is trying to uh, work better on recognizing that methane emissions are really bad for us. Um, and they're, they've been reducing the threshold that triggers what um, restaurant food waste must go to a dedicated food waste center. Um, so it's something to keep in mind if you're planning to have a restaurant on site, you need to, to, to consider that you probably need to have some type of um, organic waste collection on site um, for all of the extra food uh, material. Great. And so um, on commissioning, commissioning is one of the few items that is um, both in the energy code part six and in Cal Green part 11. Um, they're almost completely aligned. Uh, I'll just point out a couple of differences so that you're um, on board. Commissioning is triggered uh, for a building that's over 10,000 square feet. Uh, that's new construction. So again, um, the second tenant improvement does not, uh, that's considered a renovation and doesn't uh, trigger commissioning. Uh, but it's a good thing. It's, uh, we use it as mandatory for lead certification projects of any size, and it, we found it to be a really effective tool. And it has this, um, we call the circle of accountability in that rather than just having the, um, the owner start at one end, here's what we want, and here's the architect, and then the builder, and, and, uh, and then there's really no uh, connection between the two. This is a way to have the, the owner uh, communicate what they're looking for in this owner project requirements. Then it goes to the design team. The design team has a basis of design that reflects what the owner wants. Uh, that gets into the plans and specifications. There's a design review. That's actually required for all projects in um, uh, through the energy code, this design review. And then, uh, then there's a commissioning plan. The plan makes sure that there's a way to test for all of the other pieces. And then the actual in the field commissioning. So a lot of people think of that part as commissioning, uh, but, you, but it builds on all the other pieces. And then finally at the end, the commissioning authority has a report that says, yes, owner what you wanted at the beginning in terms of um, air quality and uh, maintenance uh, ability and controllability and all those kinds of things. We've tested for that and the whole thing works. So that's um, commissioning, again, new buildings over 10,000 square feet for the bulk of that work. Uh, the first part of these are all required as part of plan check. So they should go in with your uh, building permit application. And then the second part is done during construction. And uh, you certify at the beginning that you will do these things. And the inspector can ask for documentation in the field, but it doesn't have its own 
um, separate um, uh, accountability on that. There's a form. Again, these are free online um, for building commissioning, the NRCC um, CXRE. And uh, uh, just look for that form. It's interactive. You click on the size and it'll open up what you need and uh, you can go through it. And within the commissioning itself, um, that it's, uh, as we say, it's also part of Title 24, uh, that there's this design review required. Cal Green and irrigation and PV. Strangely, the energy code does not, the energy code is just HVAC, um, plumbing, electrical lighting, et cetera, but uh, Cal Green, you have to do that. So make sure you're keeping them all together. So uh, before you jump in, it looks like we do have a question. Okay. Uh, I vaguely think I saw something where commissioning can now be under contract to the project architect. Can you confirm that? Um, yes, there was some, uh, so the way it is uh, set up is that the, um, the architect, um, uh, it, it needs to be an independent commissioning authority. And then in our commissioning program, we go through a whole uh, uh, section. Um, we have a whole uh, session just on commissioning. And in that we talk about what qualifies. So if the building is small, uh, under 10,000 square feet, the architect can do their own uh, design review. If it's um, 10,000 to 50,000 and re relatively simple systems, then the commissioning authority can be within that firm, um, but um, uh, has to not be associated with the project and larger complicated projects. They have to actually be in a, in a separate firm, not part of the design work. In terms of who does the contracting, I think Peggy is right, is that there that it used to be you couldn't even contract together, but now um, you are allowed to have the architect um, have that authority under the uh, contract. And just to throw a plug, next month, uh, I believe on the 23rd, we are having a, a non-res commissioning course. Um, so if you want to learn more, oh, yeah. you just sign up. Yeah, end of July. Yeah, thank you. Okay, great questions. Okay, and then for projects that are under 10,000 square feet, you are required to do uh, testing and adjusting, which is what you would be doing anyway as part of your um, uh, testing, adjusting, balancing. But in this case, it actually needs to be a written um, plan in terms of um, having that uh, taken under consideration. Okay, this is our last uh, mandatory chapter that we'll be going over, so environmental quality. Uh, first uh, measure is fireplaces. So fireplaces uh, that are installed need to be direct vent sealed combustion. Um, they have to meet the energy code and any local ordinances. Um, wood stove, some wood stoves and pellet stoves are allowed. Um, they do have to comply under the EPA um, to meet specific emission limits. Um, and they should, if, if you're curious what those are, they should be referenced in the code sections in the upper right. Uh, in terms of filtration, the, uh, if you're running the systems um, that you have to have at least uh, a MERV-8 uh, in order to do a, um, a flush out in those. Um, so that's for the temporary ventilation. Uh, pollutant control. So the next uh, like four slides or so, four or five, um, are going to cover low emitting materials and why we care about them. Um, most of the levels in the slides that are coming up uh, reference VOCs or volatile organic compounds. Uh, the reason why there are limits on these is they're, they're bad for your lungs they, and they're bad for the environment. So that's why we want to make sure that we're uh, following what's the, the limits that are set out. Uh, typically in California, they're, they're all selling the uh, products that comply, but you just need to make sure that you're using the product for its intended purpose. Um, and uh, the next following slides will cover carpets, paints, um, sealants, coatings, and finishes. And um, we'll probably touch on a couple other ones. Um, so adhesives and aerosol, aerosol adhesives um, both need to follow uh, requirements listed either through the state or through the South Coast Air Quality Management District. Um, both of those, you, there are tables on the slide that you can reference. Um, we can go ahead and jump to the next one. 
paints and coatings, same thing. So this covers uh, architectural paints and coatings, uh, roof wood and flooring coatings, uh, primer sealants, shellacs, aerosol paints and coatings. So uh, you want to make sure that you're following those VOC limits because uh, I don't, I'm sure everyone here has uh, painted a room and tried to live in it at the same time and it it's not fun. Um, you don't want to do it. So verification for a lot of these. So you can either use the, the listing of the product and the location that it was used in uh, or some type of invoice and a, a material safety data sheet or MSDS that lists the, the limits on there. Um, you want to make sure that you have um, the, the requirements are listed on the note set or in the notes on the plan set um, and you you want to be sure that you're able to verify these. So make sure that you have the cut sheets available. Um, carpet. So it has to meet a uh, carpet that is being installed has to meet one of the four uh, requirements below. Um, there's a bunch on the screen. Uh, I don't need to go into all of them. Um, uh, carpet cushion and adhesive, similar thing. It needs to meet uh, thresholds. Uh, indoor carpet adhesive and carpet pad adhesive need to be at uh, 50 grams per liter or less. Um, and then outdoor carpet adhesives need to be at 150 grams per less. Um, uh, covering of ducts, duct openings um, during construction. So everything should arrive at the job site covered but you do need to continue to keep these covered during construction so that you don't have to go through and clean all of them at the end. Um, if you keep it covered the whole time, you don't have to, to deal with all of that at the end. Um, something else that you may wanna consider is covering the ends of water pipes um, so that critters and, and dust and everything doesn't get into there. Resilient flooring. So uh, resilient flooring is something like cork linoleum, sheet vinyl. It does not include wood, tile, concrete, and carpet. 80% um, of resilient flooring needs to meet one of the following um, uh, standards below. There's four of them. And then there's some examples on the right of what those resilient flooring systems look like. Composite wood products. Um, so this is, again, kind of where uh, we need to make sure that uh, the wood products are meeting the formaldehyde requirements. Um, and structural wood is the only exception to this measure, but you need to make sure that you have some type of documentation to verify that it meets those formaldehyde requirements. So that could be anything from a stamped product, chain of custody, an invoice uh, that indicates compliance, manufacturer statement, or the product website. Um, so if you wanna go to the next slide. So these are some examples. Um, everything like this product is regulated, but how would you know it complies unless you have that type of verification? And um, similar to like painting your room, if you've ever unboxed, uh, you know, a, a desk or something that you have to put together and it just it reeks. Um, that that's where the formaldehyde is coming in. You don't you don't want that in your house because you don't want to be breathing it in. Right. Um, when you get to uh, the filters for the permanent system use in the non-residential world, you need to have at least a, a MERV 13. This was actually um, a, pr a pretty big jump from MERV 8 to MERV 13, and, um, and, and they're thick, right? So, and you can't just, you know, retrofit. You need to actually design to have a system because it takes a lot more energy to draw air through these thicker filters. We're really happy about them now for those projects that happen ha happen to have them already, and because uh, obviously a lot of focus right now on indoor air quality and it, it's catching a higher level of particulates. They're not viral; they don't catch virus. So if you um, are concerned, like in a medical setting, um, that you'll be wanting to do more like a HEPA filter or some other kind of filter. And then uh, tobacco smoke uh, is uh, obviously no smoking in our buildings, uh, but also just make sure that you have the signage and uh, that says that um, you have to be 25 feet away. You can either have kind of the long version or you can also put no smoking on this um, on property on premises uh, or smoking only at a designated smoking area that is 25 feet away. 
uh, concrete slab and capillary break. So the purpose of this measure is to keep uh, moisture from moving uh, from the slab into the building. Uh, so all slab foundations need to have a vapor retarder and a capillary break. So that could be like four inch, four inch layer of half inch gravel, gravel um, with a, a vapor retarder over the top. Um, so the, the next slide is just kind of an example of what capillary break is for your reference to, to learn some more information about it if you're interested. And then the next one is, a, is the vapor barrier. So on the right, or sorry, on the left, we see a, a slab with no vapor retarder or capillary break. And on the right, we see one where it is actually installed um, over, over gravel to act as a capillary break and the vapor retarder. Um, you want to make sure that you're using a, a quality vapor retarder so that it actually holds up um, over time. Right, because uh, yeah, once you put the on the one on the right, once you put that rebar on, um, you want to make sure it's not going to uh, torn up. So um, something thick. Mm -hmm. uh, moisture content of building materials. So similarly, how you don't want moisture getting into the uh, building from below, you want to make sure that you're not installing materials that have uh, visible water damage or mold, because uh, once you kind of put that in there, you're stuck with it. Um, Wall and, and, or just sorry, one thing you have to do three random floor and wall measure tests. Um, just some examples along the bottom of, of some materials you don't want to be using on the left and some materials that uh, you do want to use on the right. Uh, bathroom exhaust fans, um, your exhaust needs to be ducted outside. Uh, it needs to be Energy Star certified. Um, and unless it's being used as whole house ventilation, the fans need to be controlled by a humidistat, um, either on the wall or in unit uh, that's capable of keeping the, the area at 50 to 80% relative humidity. Um, HVAC uh, system design. So this is uh, and a really important measure. Uh, this also uh, triggers some of the energy code stuff so that you'll see some more overlap. Um, your HVAC system needs to be size designed and the equipment needs to be selected using ACA manual JDNS um, or ASHRAE. This is really to make sure that your system is right size for the building. It's protecting your indoor air quality. So making sure that you're um, breathing good air. You don't wanna be breathing air that's coming from the attic or the crawl space. Um, your documentation, this needs to be included on your drawings and your calculations. This is, a, again, a really important one. I know it's not always the most fun to do, but um, it's, I mean, it's how we keep our, our indoor air healthy. In terms of indoor uh, moisture control, you know, there's a sweet spot here in terms of if the building is very dry, um, you'll get um, uh, some health implications, or if it's very moist, you'll get health implications, negative health implications. But uh, thankfully, there's this kind of zone in the middle of humidity, 40 to 60 percent, that is great for humans and bad for bugs and other critters. So that's um, some of what we're trying to uh, take care of when we're when we're looking at those fans and the uh, circulation measures. So some additional um, requirements for those applications. Uh, and then otherwise, we're really looking at tying into the energy code, the California energy code and the um, uh, uh, California code of regulations in terms of what's allowed in our indoor environments. And of course, if you're doing uh, demand control ventilation, you have to have CO2 sensors in order to, um, to trigger that. So mostly again, like the energy section, this is just comply with the other uh, codes. Um, acoustic control, I always think it's really interesting because in the early days of green building, this wasn't part of it. We didn't think like, well, you know, acoustic, that's something else. But what they found was that acoustics were really important for um, the health of the occupants. And so there's a, a couple of different sections. One is about the uh, exterior noise and one is about the interior noise in terms of our assembly. So there's some standards that are employed here. Uh, on the left is like a double stud um, wall in between uh, tenants, um, having quality windows, 
uh, 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 thermal insulation that also works well for um, acoustic control. In terms of air exterior noise, the prescriptive approach is basically if you're near um, a con the um, noise contours for an airport or freeway or train, there is an STC, a sound transmission class um, requirement of 50. Um, on a decent exterior wall, that's not usually too much of a problem. You gotta make sure it's on your roof as well. And then the, um, the windows have a STC of um, 40, um, or if you're doing the other kind of calculation, uh, 30. So you can look these up in terms of the noise contours and um, make sure that your wall legend has it on the plan. In terms of interior spaces that we require um, a separation between tenants. So in, uh, in this case, uh, there's one tenant that already has is building a space and the wall in between them and the future tenant needs to meet at least the um, SDC of uh, 40 within that uh, tenant space or a hallway or anything like that. And then, you know, there's some tricky spots in terms of, uh, you know, uh, pipes banging. There's a lot of different ceiling products. Um, uh, you know, you're going to be wanting to think about ways to um, have that kind of acoustic control. Um, and then within ozone, again, uh, pretty normal stuff that's in other code sections in terms of CF CFC. Uh, the chlorofluorocarbons and um, and suppression non uh, for equipment with no halons. And then also new to the 2019 code is uh, supermarket refrigeration leak reduction. So if you happen to work in that realm, be sure to look up that section. So those are the mandatory measures. We're just going to touch on very on uh, pretty briefly on how it works for the voluntary tiers. And in this case, um, uh, within the residential section, within each category, in order to hit tier one, there's mandatory um, additional measures, and then you add um, electives. And so the electives might be things like um, uh, a, a gray water capture. Uh, might be one in the um, plant in the water efficiency section, or improved um, uh, recycled content of your um, building materials, or purchasing things locally, or you know those types of um, lead. Uh, if you think of lead certification kinds of measures that aren't already mandatory, it's those types of things. So tier one uh, would have this number of electives and requires, and then there's tier two. And then within the non-residential world, kind of similar setup, uh, additional mandatory measures. Um, interesting, like, like in the material conservation, one of the additional mandatory measures is tracking the recycled content um, of your materials. So you're kind of intentionally selecting um, ceiling materials and flooring materials that have a high recycled content. That drives an economy for being able to capture recycled material, which is a goal of California. So those are the tiers um, and uh, a jurisdiction is allowed to adopt either the entire tier and say that buildings need to fit into, um, must meet these requirements, especially of a certain size. So that's what um, Slow County has done, projects over 10,000 square feet. Um, they didn't um, include the reach code on the energy code itself, but the rest of the measures are required or a jurisdiction can adopt uh, specific measures within a tier. So maybe an irrigation, um, higher efficiency for irrigation. And there, we've gone through. Uh, now it's a chance to ask questions, open it up. If you have um, uh, any discussion items you wanna bring up, let's just see if anybody has anything going on before we wrap it up. And feel free share. to unmute yourself as well if um, yeah you can chat if or you'd just rather unmute. ask your question. Mm -hmm. Right, we're all friends here. Has anybody um, had issues or concerns with Cal Green with the application? I know that uh, sometimes it comes back as a as a plan check, and people aren't necessarily prepared, um, and. Um, or, or 
you know, frustration. And then while people are thinking of their questions, the one thing that I would add is, um, is kind of the sneak peek of the next cycle of code uh, for Cal Green. And it's really a um, little bit of cleanup language and then otherwise really focused on electric vehicles and trying to add um, better um, actual chargers so that we're more ready for that transition for electric vehicles. Looks like we do have a question in the chat. Uh, are volunteer tiers something that the jurisdiction would require, say, under a cap? Um, yes, under, go ahead, Lauren, under yeah, a climate action well, plan. Yeah, a climate action plan is, is uh, a cap. Um, they could require it under a climate action plan, but they would still have to go through the process of adopting it uh, during a regular cycle of, um, when they're adopting the building code or or afterwards and and uh it would kind of be considered a reach code um a code that requires above or uh ordinance that requires above code uh construction um so it could it could call it out in the cap but that's not the like adopting uh body for it right so you'd have to adopt a specific ordinance absolutely it could tie into the cap um, and then it does need to run through anytime you do a, a reach code on the energy code, it needs to go through the uh, uh, energy commission. But the way that the um, tiers are set up is to be within um, what is uh, cost effective and so should be justified. That's the way they have that. Uh, we got another question. Uh, does the building inspector certify Cal Green compliance during final inspection? Yeah, great question, because uh, I think compliance and how to do compliance has been a little bit of a struggle. Uh, in theory, that yes, that the uh, building inspector would be the one that um, uh, checks off to see, you know, some things are already incorporated in the plan, so the plans examiner is going to have that covered, uh, and then other things are going to happen in the field. So the inspector could be asking for um, uh, compliance documentation for the um, paints and low emitting materials, for example, uh, we like to keep a binder on site so it's available. And that way, if, it, if they ask for it or not, we can we can show. But some things are like, you know, the, the bathroom fans with a humidistat. I mean, that's huge. That's really important for the space and um, often gets either maybe it, it's in the plans, but the contractor does a substitution not being aware of um, that requirement in terms of the ongoing um, ventilation and what speed is required. So that's something that we definitely see inspectors um, uh, looking for. They used to have to always look for a low flow plumbing fixture, you know, but that's kind of all we sell now. So, so I think they're kind of targeting those measures. Um, and then um, I'm going to add something else to that in terms of the um, building inspectors. Oh, just on commissioning that the commissioning, again, doesn't actually have a requirement. Um, uh, but in each of these, uh, we've been on projects where the jurisdiction has required the builder, like on a, on a big um, track development, to um, uh, have, hire a third party um, verifier for Cal Green. So, so that's the jurisdiction, it says in, um, in the uh, administration section of Cal Green that the jurisdiction can require a, um, uh, an outside uh, certification of the um, compliance with Cal Green. Good question. Maybe, Sean, while we're waiting for some more questions, do we want to launch the survey? Good call. Yeah, we'll pull up a little closing survey uh, just to get a little pulse on how you guys enjoyed the training today. Uh, but keep any questions coming in while I pull that up. And this, I know it's a, a pain in the butt to do a final survey, but it does really help us. Um, learn how we can make these better for you all and feel free to um if there's you want to send in um uh written feedback please feel free to do so um to sean or myself or andy 
Right. Absolutely. And you're always welcome to do the uh, code coach. Um, if you just go to 3CREN.org, if you ever have a question, uh, I know we talk about the energy code most of the time, but our program does include the Cal Green as well. So uh, feel free to send in your or call uh, into the code uh, under Code Connect. It's the Code Coach program, all free. And I'm uh, just trying to make all of this a little bit easier. Awesome. Leave it Sean put it in the, uh, can you go back one okay. slide, Andy? Sure. Perfect. There you go. Yeah. And like you're saying, just put the link in the, in the, in the chat so you can ask code questions there or, um, find the phone number to do so as well. Um, and yeah, while we're waiting, still think of any questions, um, we'll have one more opportunity to, to answer those. Uh, but we do have some, AIA and ICC learning units available for today's course. Um, so if you put your uh, number in during registration, I'll get those out to you. Um, and if you're not sure, you can email my uh, me. My email is the right there on the screen. Um, and like Lauren was mentioning, uh, we'll get the slides and uh, recording out to you as well as um, there is a form in the email we'll send. We can also provide some written comment on today's course um, if you're interested too. Um, and then next week we do have a course what energy consultants need to know about HERS features, um, specifically for energy consultants and how to um, best prepare a project to pass HERS tests and empower the project team um, to to pass those measures as well. But um, any kind of member of a, of a project team um, from the architect to the energy consultant and the contractor, um, that course would be relevant for it to learn more, a little bit more about HERS, the home energy rating system. Um, and then our full kind of Q3, our, our calendar for the rest of the year uh, will be coming soon. Um, but like Andy and Lauren mentioned, we do have a non-residential commissioning class that we are scheduling uh, for July. So we can keep, uh, Stay in touch and we'll and we'll share more about that soon. Um, All right. I have one oh. one more thing I can share too before we go. Um, we did just launch our on-demand page um, for 3C Run trainings and events. So check that out. You can see a few different versions of um, our trainings that uh, we think are, are pretty essential, including a previous version of this training, but we'll probably be updating that with today's event. So check that out. I'll put that in the chat. Looks like we did get a question. Uh, working with commercial developers who are focused on their bottom line, do you have any thoughts on steering them towards going beyond minimum requirements for Cal Green or LEED? Uh, it's, it's hard to convince them to pay for the additional documentation costs. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I find the same struggles. Uh, I think that the, uh, that there's, um, you know, we often talk about the uh, public perception and that the, um, that there's studies that do show that, uh, uh, especially a younger generation, uh, proactively seek and pre preferentially purchase from firms that companies, organizations that demonstrate environmental stewardship. So I think that's a really important one. It can be full on lead or even just uh, uh, goals towards zero net energy, uh, lower carbon use. So kind of whatever fits that um, project. It, it is, it's also interesting, the um, uh, county of San Luis Obispo does require a project's um, to do a basis of design for uh, solar panels. So whereas the code requires you to, for non-residential to do a uh, solar ready area, um, you have to actually install it for new residential, but for non-res, you don't have to install anything, but the county requires a, a, basis, a basis of design that includes a return on investment. And a lot of times what, what we see is that when we do the ROI, get an actual price that um, that building owners end up installing the the, um, the PVs anyway. So we find that to be very helpful. So if there's a way that you can incorporate into your fees, um, oh yes, and we include a, um, 
a PV uh, basis of design. And then that way you have something in front of them to be able to show like, oh, hey, and by the way, if you install these PVs, you'll get uh, payback in seven years or even 10 years because the products, you know, they, um, they're going to last 20 or 30 years at least. So, uh, so good value there in terms of the renewable energy um, and then the stewardship, uh, uh, higher rents, uh, again, for organizations that um, demonstrate that their buildings are organizations that want to demonstrate environmental stewardship are going to preferentially lease buildings that are LEED certified or have some other kind of green building um, strategy. Yeah, great yeah. conversation. Peggy, if you have anything else too, you're welcome to unmute and see if you've had the success on anything. Sorry, Lauren, what were you saying? No, no, I just, I was going to say it brings up a, a kind of a good point that it's hard to, a lot of times it's hard to demonstrate, uh, you know, why these are helpful for us when we're kind of just now on the, the upswing of understanding that better built buildings lead to healthier occupants. And that's, Kind of hard to to sell someone on, right? Like the yeah, that that it just came up yesterday. It's like, oh, have this commercial development. They're doing their checklist, and it's like, oh, and by the way, you know, how, how do we how do we how do we do the minimum for you know to keep it in their budget, whatever. So yeah, that that's really helpful about. Um, some of that data and some of the basis of design stuff. But, but of course, I think even still internally, the question gets raised by the design team too far along, you know, for, for, for me or me to bring in Andy or something. So. Um, right, it, it's kind of, sure, it's a lot harder. The later in the process that you yeah. do it, the more expensive it is to add on in terms of energy efficiency or even any of those other strategies of, um, you know, rainwater management on site. If you're, if that's a goal at the beginning, then that's just, you know, then you let people know. I mean, we're finding that like uh, um, the emphasis that's coming up that, that emerging um, interest in low embodied energy low embodied carbon. So like concrete and steel are particularly uh, carbon intensive. And, um, but there's really, there's a lot of options for lower carbon concrete. And if you ask at the beginning uh, that this is a goal, then sometimes there's no cost change at all. Uh, the structural engineer can work with the, um, the supplier and the specifications of the, of the material itself and, um, and get a, a mixed design that meets the performance requirements, but isn't, you know, maybe as blanket as everything has a 28 day cure strength, for example, you might be able to use less cement um, and have a better outcome, but, but you don't need it to come to full strength for, you know, 58 days or whatever. So if you um, if you are a little bit more intentional about what what really needs to happen for the concrete, you can actually reduce the carbon footprint at no cost change at all. But it's different. So people, you know, yeah, people need to know to ask. I have to talk to our structural about that. That's good. To know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really a very. Um, interesting and emerging, emerging and the concrete industry gets it. They know yeah. that they're under the microscope yeah. for, um, for their contribution to current concerns. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. There are some jurisdictions, I'm not aware of any down uh, in the, the 3C Ren region, but there are some who are looking into and I think implementing low carbon concrete uh, ordinances um, so this, who knows, the way that reach codes kind of move through the state, we may be seeing stuff down the road. Yeah, so keep an eye out for that for sure. Mm -hmm. Great. Anyone else want to chime in? Otherwise, we'll close it up. And if something comes across your mind afterwards, please feel free to, to shoot it into the code coach. Um, I'll just do another plug for it. We, we will do project reviews with you. So if you have a project that you're struggling with some part of the, the energy or green building code, uh, feel free to send it in. It, our uh, form online takes, takes files so you can submit um, 
the the plan set or the Title 24 calcs or whatever it is, um, we're, we're really happy to help. Right, and, and it's uh, building plans examiners, inspectors, architects, builders, um, homeowners, you know, building owners mm -hmm. that's uh, available to anyone. So. All right. Well, awesome. thanks everyone. Go ahead, Sean. Oh, just want to thank you, Andy, and thank you, Lauren. A uh, great training today, and thank you for your time. Yeah, we're glad everybody was able to come. Oh, it looks like we do have a hand raised. No, that's a that's an applause. Thank you. Oh, is that an applause? <laughs> I haven't seen that before. <laughs> uh, much appreciated. All right, thanks everyone. Have a good thank one. Thank you all. Bye. Have a great day. Bye.